All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Patrick McCann. I'm a heart failure cardiologist in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, these are some tough acts to follow, so I'll do my best to uh, emphasize why we have uh, built our neuromodulation program uh, with Barostem in mind. These are my disclosures. This is a little bit of what our clinic looks like. We have a pretty good experience with heart failure, a wide spectrum of disease. Uh, we work with LVADs as well as CardioMEMS, uh, as Dr. Cole was pointing out. Um, however, we are a non-transplant facility. Uh, we certainly have a multidisciplinary approach uh, to our heart failure patients, utilizing pharmacists, social workers, uh, APPs. Um, with that, uh, we function probably more as a clinical heart failure uh, or a community heart failure clinic um, for our patients. And so I'll give you a little bit of our experience. Uh, Dr. Cole went through his experience and ours has been similar. Uh, we've only been implanting since about November of 2021, uh, but we've ramped up quickly because of the results that we have seen for our patients. Uh, so on this slide, there's a couple things. On the left side, you can see our patient characteristics uh, for about the first 20 that we did uh, at six months. Uh, we certainly weren't picking patients that were doing well, right? These are sick folks, fair amount of ischemic, class three. And, and I like to point out the part about the GDMT there. We try as best as we can to optimize GDMT according to the guidelines and getting people on the Fantastic Four, as was uh, pointed out earlier. However, that Fantastic Four is really difficult for them to show up all at the same time uh, at max tolerated dose. Um, so for our folks, they were on about two and a half uh, out of the four therapies. The results, however, uh, were outstanding and they were in line with what we saw with BDHF, right? Reduction in NT pro BNP, improvements in MOHA, people are feeling better. And the other part here, I think, that, that hasn't been emphasized yet enough uh, is the low risk of complication from the device, right? This is outside of any of the vascular uh, places where we put all of our other devices. Um, very low risk for complications, uh, and that's something that we really liked when we were starting to evaluate the therapy. We've seen this slide before. Dr. Grisette did a great job of going through uh, the progression of the uh, heart failure disease. We started probably implanting folks initially that were a little on the right-hand side of that second red line there, uh, similar to what Dr. Cole had mentioned, folks that we didn't have a whole lot of great options for them. They weren't tolerating therapy, maybe they weren't a VAD or a transplant candidate at the time, uh, but had a very poor quality of life, just functionally limited. Right, and that goes beyond just being symptomatic, right? It's one thing to be short of breath at the door. It's another thing to not be able to even enjoy any aspect of your life, right? And I think that's something that we sometimes uh, forget about when we're treating some of our patients, focusing so much on their symptoms and their breathing, but can they actually get back to living? With the results that we saw in those uh, early initial patients, and I'll go through a couple examples here in a minute, we've certainly started moving in between the red lines, just similar to what we've done with a lot of other heart failure therapies, whether that's medical therapy and moving into the class two folks, or even our LVADs trying to get them implanted when they're Intermax three, earlier intervention is better. So our first case example is a gentleman um, would come in with his uh, granddaughter all the time in a clinic, uh, really nice guy, but couldn't do anything. History of ischemic heart, disease, you can see he's class three. We tried to titrate his therapy as best as possible. It's on pretty minimal amount of medications. These are folks that you probably see in your heart failure clinic and you do your best to get those meds up, but they start coming in with lightheadedness, dizziness, not tolerating therapies, whether it's impacts on renal function or hyperkalemia from some of their MRAs, but he just kept getting hospitalized and he felt terrible, he couldn't do anything. And you can see there, six minute hall walk, 30 meters, the guy would get dizzy, get lighted, have to wait, start up again. We discussed a lot of options with him, like we do with all of our patients, right? Trying other therapies, whether that's Evabridine or Versigwad or considering inotropes and LVADs. Um, but at 83, he's really looking more for quality of life. Uh, and as Dr. Cole pointed out, that quality of life is incredibly important, but it's also incredibly important as we get a little bit older. And if you've seen enough patients, when they start to get into that kind of 70s, mid 70s or older, they're focusing on quality of life. They want to be able to do things, not just live longer necessarily. 
Uh, and I think that's very important for us to start recognizing sooner rather than later, especially uh, with the age of our population increasing. So we put a baristim in him. Uh, we titrated over about four months. Uh, we did a little bit of a slower titration back then because um, he was one of our earlier uh, implants. And since that time, he's not been hospitalized. You can see his six minute hall walk there. Uh, but more importantly, he has come back into the clinic and expressed just how much he is enjoying life. One of his big things was gardening. He's able to go out into the garden, enjoy planting uh, all the things that he likes to in the spring, uh, which he hasn't been able to do. And that gives him great joy. Uh, and to us, that is a huge benefit uh, to the patient. Uh, and his granddaughter thinks so as well. The second example here uh, is a gentleman that was probably a little bit uh, further down in the progression of his heart failure. Came into me, uh, had been seen previously, referred uh, for advanced therapies. We talked about VAD, inotropes, did his right heart cath, put him on a little bit of milrinone for a while, and he felt great. Had an excellent response, really good blood pressure response. We started titrating his GDMT, uh, didn't tolerate uh, a little bit um, because of UTI and then uh, because his blood pressure started dropping. We successfully weaned him off inotropes and he did okay for a little while, but then he started dwindling. And we've all seen those patients, right, that start to have a little bit of heart failure, a little worsening, can't quite get up the driveway now, and he was becoming much more frustrated because he didn't feel as well. We talked about advanced therapies again, and he doesn't want them. Right? That's just not what he wants for his life. He doesn't want a drive line. He doesn't want batteries. And he was very frank about it. He said, listen, I'm not, I'm not looking to live another 10 years. It's like, if I could just feel better, that would be great. Uh, so we talked about Barristan. We said, hey, I, I don't know that it's going to make you live longer. By the data, there's a good chance that you'll feel better. And uh, he was agreeable. And we, we had that discussion. We went ahead and implanted. And you can see our titration was a little faster. Because after a month, when he came back in to talk to me, he said, okay, you put this device in me. I don't feel any different. What's going on? I said, okay, well, hey, well, pump the brakes here. Hold on. We haven't even titrated the device yet. Uh, and he said, well, can we get this thing moving along quicker? I said, sounds good. Let's, let's try and do that. Uh, and I think that's one of the big things with heart failure. Uh, when you're treating it, we live in a gray area, right? You got to be open to ideas. You got to kind of dwell in the ideas uh, of possibility and what you can do. And so we moved his titration along a little faster. Uh, and after we were finished with his titration, you can see a six minute hall walk. He hasn't had any hospitalizations, but again, he's living, he's traveling with his wife. He's a big thing for him was taking care of the yard was always his responsibility and he couldn't do it. Now he puts on his blower, he's blowing his yard, he's mowing his lawn. He can walk up at his driveway, which is up an incline. He is enjoying life again. This is our titration strategy now, and we will probably actually uh, increase this um, in the last three that we've um, implanted. We're starting to do this on a weekly basis. Uh, certainly it worked at every two weeks of increasing. And what we do is we'll bring them in, titrate their device, and we don't really make much in the way of titration of their neurohormonal blockade uh, at that time. Most of these patients have already been titrated. Uh, to their max dose by then, uh, but we do adjust diuretics. That's certainly something that we've noticed uh, in our experience is that they have an uh, increased volume loss uh, early on, and so you have to adjust that with the diuretics uh, to avoid any lightheadedness. And then after they're completed their titration, they still have room, which that's been another benefit that we've seen is a stabilization of blood pressure, if not actually a little bit of an improvement, uh, then we will uh, continue to titrate uh, GDMT. And then we finish usually by getting the repeat six minute hall walk and a follow up NT Pro BNP. With that, I think there's some things that we, we have to talk about in, in heart failure. And there is a significant unmet need. As Dr. Gazette pointed out, we have come a long way with GDMT. The challenging part is what you saw in Evolution HF. People don't want to take a whole bunch of medications. We talk about the Fantastic Four, the Four Pillars, whatever you want to call it, you add that into somebody that has diabetes and ischemic heart disease, suddenly that person's on eight to 10 medications. That's very challenging for somebody to get up every day and take eight to 10 medications at multiple times throughout the day. And it's not a surprise that they discontinue their therapies. Also not a surprise to what Dr. Cole mentioned, uh, that device therapies uh, tend to do a little bit better there. Adoption of Baristim allows you to expand your therapeutic approach. It's important, right? You get another tool in your toolbox uh, to utilize for those patients. And I think earlier intervention is certainly where we need to go with these patients. Uh, as Dr. Cole pointed out, and in our experience as well, 
uh, it's going to work better for your patients overall, even if that is maybe slowing their time uh, to transplant. Uh, again, less therapies that they have to be on and a better quality of life. Uh, anecdotally, we have seen reduced hospitalizations in our patients, um, and I'm excited to see uh, what comes of that as we continue to move forward with our program. Uh, but patient selection is critical, earlier intervention, uh, optimizing the GDMT is still very important, uh, but this device should be utilized more frequently uh, for our heart failure patients. Thank you.